Okay, welcome back to Mystery at Carl's Bad Tavern. I didn't put an S on it. Everyone asked me, why you say Carl's Bad's Tavern? I don't know. I just do. If it bothers you, mute it. Anyway, uh, this is close. This may be the final episode. This may be the finale. There may be some updates after this at some point in time. But as of now, this is the end. I'm going to tell you what happened to Brenda Condon, in my opinion. Um, so, let's get into it. I know the suspense has been killing you. But think of how the family feels. 33 years going through this. Um, so, to me, again... It's not entertainment. This is real life stuff. Okay. The ripple effects of an unsolved case. It's just like throwing a stone into a pond and seeing those ripples. And each one of those ripples is a community, is a family member, is a friend, is a law enforcement officer that worked on the case, and so on and so on. I always find that that's a good analogy when describing the effects of cold cases. So, let's start with the day Brenda disappears, okay? February 26th. It's a Tuesday night. Um, and I'll tell you the, the major clue that helped me figure this out. Brenda works her entire shift. She punches out, rings out the register at 1.30 in a.m. She takes the cash drawer. She puts it where it's supposed to be, in the manager's office. At some point, that's where she disappears. Now, I'll explain to you exactly where, why, and how. She disappears. She's supposed to be in at 11 in the a.m. Of course, she's not there. Doors unlocked. Nobody's there. Okay. Until 1250. The first vendor guy comes in there. Okay. And then around 115, 120, the rug guy comes in there. And remember, and they don't see anybody or anything. And then... Six o'clock at night, the relieving bartender comes in. Now, what he observes will play into this. Because remember, he calls Carl. Hey, Brenda's not here. Carl calls Greg. Greg says, she didn't come home last night. Call police. Carl calls the bartender back. Bartender calls police. The ball's rolling. Okay. He observes patrons serving themselves. He tells Carl this. Now that's important, right? Because now, step back 33 years or whatever, and let's look at what that tells us. The vendor guy says, hey, when I'm there, you know, I do the pool table, cigarette machines, whatever it is, and I put the money on the bar and I leave. Well, when I asked him, hey, what did you see? He says, and this is crucial, 
This is crucial. This is the crux of the investigation. And I missed it. I missed it originally. And that's why it's so important to get back and go back and go back. He said, I've seen a bottle and a couple dollar bills on the bar. Now, at first sight, when you sit back and you look at it, you're like, well, what's the big deal? Because you're thinking, well, the patrons were serving themselves, number one, or Brenda didn't clean up the bar and she was taken, right? Not so fast, my friends. Think about this. Patrons were not serving themselves at 1250 when the vendor guy got there. Okay? They weren't serving themselves until 6 p.m. when the relieving bartender got there. Okay? And if Brenda did not clean that bar, would there not be more than one bottle on that bar? Yes. We learn from Alicia. You clean the bar before you do the money drop. The money drop is almost the last thing that you're going to do. She had already cleaned the bar. She was taking the money to the register and then something happened. And I'll get into it. So what's that tell you? That bottle... That single bottle is from your offender. Now, how can you say that, Kenny? I just explained it to you. If, if that was from, in, in the money, a couple of dollars there, you know what that was? Come on, somebody said it. It was her tip. Now, how can I deduce that? Because... If it was somebody that had bought a beer, she would have taken that, that money and rung it up. She was done. The night was done. But there was somebody sitting there waiting for her to close that bar. One person. Because there's one bottle of beer left on that table when the vendor gets there. That's your killer, folks. Details. It's in the details. So, now that I've deduced that, okay, somebody was waiting there for Brenda to get off work. One beer bottle there. Everything else was cleaned, okay? She's cleaning around, the, you know, and there's one person there waiting. He gets the tips there, you know, from when he had been drinking earlier, whatever it is. There's no doubt in my mind that that's the offender. So based on that, we can start eliminating suspects. Number one, Carl, gone. He didn't do this. Greg, gone. He didn't do this. Now, is it still possible that somebody from Greg's crew or could have done this? Sure, but I'll get into why that's not that's not possible. The lights. When and I clarified this with the vendor guy. When he got there, all the lights were off. Okay? But there was two that were still on. The girl's bathroom light on. The kitchen light on. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you what happened inside that bar that makes sense to me and why those lights are on. And this is going to incorporate the boots. 
make no mistake, Brenda was wearing those boots. Okay. I had some trepidation. Alicia said about not being able to wear those boots. That's false. She wore those boots because a witness put out the clothing description that that's what she was wearing. They saw her in the bar working and she had those boots on. So she took off those boots. Now, the reason she took off those boots is still unclear to me, but I can surmise that either A, it's because she changed into a pair of sneakers to clean, maybe. I, I find that a little bit more doubtful. Her feet could have been hurting from wearing them, or maybe because of the snow outside, she didn't want to get them wet or get them ruined. But she parked right next to the door, so I wouldn't think that either. But it doesn't matter. She removed those boots, okay? An offender didn't remove them. So how did they end up in the men's bathroom? Okay, well, the bottle part and the tip being the offender. I'm confident in that. that that's, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that that's what happened. Now with these boots, I'm theorizing based off of the lights. The lights being off except for the girl's bathroom, and the kitchen. Based off of that, this is what I believe happened and explains the boots. The offender is sitting there at the end of the bar. He's finishing his beer. He's waiting for Brenda, who is very flirtatious. We learned that from victimology. That's very important, okay? And plus, she's a barmaid. So, two and two. I mean, she's very flirtatious. Now, some guys, you know, they'll go to a strip club or something and they'll actually think that the stripper likes them, right? Um, no, they're doing it for the tips. More than likely, Brenda was flirting with this individual. And I'll tell you more about him as we go. But he's waiting there. And she's not being rude to him. She's closing up the bar. She's alone. Yes, she was closing that bar by herself. 100%. After she's done cleaning the bar, everything's cleaned except for one beer bottle that the offender is drinking. She tallies up the money. She puts it in the office where it's supposed to be. She had taken off her boots and more than likely placed them right there at the end of the bar so she could grab them when she leaves. When she's in the manager's office, which is where she would keep her belongings, she puts on her coat. She puts her purse on. She's ready to go. The only thing she has to do is turn out the lights and lock the door. And of course, grab her boots on the way out. But the offender, he's not done. He's there for a reason. And the reason is not to kill Brenda. The reason is to sleep with Brenda. Because she was flirting with him. So what's he do? He, as, as a joke, as flirtatious kind of thing. He grabs her boots which are on the end of the bar, and he takes them into the men's bathroom. Now, well, how do I surmise this? Because the lights are off in the bathroom, but yet they're on in the ladies' room. He turns off the lights. He's playing a little game, okay? Brenda comes out. Where's my boots? Now, she's starting to become angry. She's irritated. Listen, I just worked 10 hours. I, I'm tired. I got to get back up in the morning and get in here. Hey, in her mind, hey, I'm flirting with you for tips. I'm not, I'm not going to sleep with you. And the reason I know that emphasizes this part for me is something that I'm hesitant to speak about, but I'm going to because it's the truth. 
And the truth matters. Brenda, at 12 o'clock that day, before she went to work, she slept with her ex-husband. Now, everybody's going to get up in arms about that for one reason or another. It's the truth. So, she has no intention of sleeping with this guy. She wants to go home. But he's playing his little games, thinking he's going to get something. And he puts her boots in there and turns off the lights. So when she comes out, she's irritated. Okay? All she wanted to do was come out that manager's office, grab her boots, flick off the lights in the men's bathroom, in the girls' bathroom. The stage lights are already off because, as we learned from the bartender, during weekdays, those aren't turned on. Kitchen light off. Lock the door and out. But now she can't do that because this guy who was drinking the beer is harassing her. Flirtatious. She becomes irritated. Now we know through victimology that Brenda was fiery. Think back to Todd's interview. She just wants to go home. So she lets it be known. Okay. Now we have conflict in the bar. Remember? This is where something happens. Now, remember I said, police say there's no signs of disturbance. Maybe, but my opinion there is. Because when the rug guy came in around 1.30, 1.15 p.m., he notices the front rug in front of the main door. It's a four foot by eight foot rug. And he says, hey, at the furthest end away from the door, that rug was rolled up two feet when I got there. This is why victimology is crucial. What's Brenda do for a living? She cleans houses. She cleans residential buildings. She cleans banks. Do you think that she would walk out of that bar walking right over that without fixing it? Absolutely, 100% no. That's your disturbance. You ever see an industrial rug? Do you understand that by accident, you are not kicking that rug over and overlapping it two feet. It's not happening. The disturbance is right there. Now, whether that's from him dragging her or the shuffling of her feet, however it happens, that's the disturbance to me, in my opinion. So... To me, the beer bottle, the single beer bottle and the couple dollar bills there tells everything. There was somebody waiting for. Her. Now, who is that somebody? Well, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure it out. You have to look at proclivity of a suspect. Okay? And what does that mean? What type of person... What has he done in his past that puts him in a position to do what he's doing? Brenda had worked the previous night. Remember? It was her second night there. First as a bartender, behind the bar. The offender was there. Now, how do I know that? Because he told me. Ron. Ron was there Monday night, February 25th, with his boss, Jimmy. I spoke to Jimmy. Both confer. We were there. Now, what happened? Jimmy says Ron was his normal self, flirtatious as heck with Brenda. He even asked her out. 
Ron confirms this. Now, there is more than just that. Hey, listen, a guy flirting with a bartender is not the first thing in the world that you've ever heard of. Happens all the time. Jimmy asks Brenda to shut Ron off. Why? Jimmy says, hey, he's a DD. He's, we haven't ate yet. He's drinking on an empty stomach. Shut him off. And Brenda does. In Ron's own admission, he became angry. Now, maybe he wasn't angry at Brenda. Might have been angry at Jimmy. But they leave. And they go and eat. Now, when I spoke to Ron, he says, that's it. That's it. I'd never been to Carlsbad's Tavern again. And I wasn't there before that night. But he's lying to me. Now, how do I know this? Remember, you have to cooperate things. Number one, think back to the bartender at the Econo Lodge. Or Days In, as she said. What did, and this goes to proclivity too. What did he do to her? He sat at the end of the bar until closing, asking her out. I talked to all of Ron's crew members. They all said the same thing. He was a womanizer and he would do that all the time. Now, that doesn't make him a murderer, right? No, but we're looking at proclivities and we're looking at statements. He told her that he had been to Carlsbad's Tavern before. That's one reason I know he's lying. But you got to corroborate that. Two, I talked to Jimmy. Jimmy says, yeah, he had been there before me and him went there on, on Monday night because he had talked about how good the food was. And third, and the most important corroborating evidence there is that he's lying to me, the sketch. That sketch, remember patron number three that the police couldn't identify for 33 years. And the Milesburg bartender says, that's wrong. That puts him there the night Brenda disappears without a shadow of a doubt. They didn't make that sketch from people that were in the bar on Monday night. No, that wouldn't make sense. Tuesday night, the day she disappeared. And there was one witness who was inside that bar on February 26th who said, when I left, there was still a guy there in a black ski jacket with black curly hair. That's Ron, folks. Okay? Now, I go back to um, oh, let me add some more corroborating evidence to that because I left you on a cliffhanger the previous episode when I said there was something out of town that happened that made me put all the pieces together. On, I want to say March 9th, it was a Saturday night, a week after Brenda disappeared, that a gentleman visited Duffy's Tavern in Bullsburg. And this individual freaked out the female bartender. He was talking nonstop, incessantly, about the Brenda Condon case. Enough so that she calls police. Now, think about that. Think, 
how creeped out you have to be to call police. He paid by credit card. She calls police and says, hey, I think you need to talk to this guy. Guess what? I have his name. Ron. The same guy. So, when you take the totality of everything, the single beer bottle, the proclivity of hitting on waitresses and bartenders and staying there until they close, him being there and already starting rapport with Brenda the night before. His crewmates all saying, hey, he's a womanizer, he's done this. And every single one of them said, yeah, I mean, we kind of, ex we suspected him, but you, we don't want to say that. We don't want to point fingers. Now listen. If I'm on a crew with some people or you're on a crew with some people, do you think every single one of them would say, you better look into him? No. There's a reason they're saying that. Something else to bolster my theory on the beer bottle not being from patrons. Because listen, the vendor saw that beer bottle, single beer bottle with a couple dollar bills there, which was Brenda's tips. Uh, but there's still some naysayers out there, right? You're still saying, uh, no, it's Carl, you know, because you're tunnel visioned already. You've already made comments and statements on Facebook that it was him and you don't want to look wrong. Or Greg, it was a drug hit and you don't want to look wrong. So, you're saying, well, a patron could have came in. They opened at 11. The vendor guy didn't get there to 1250, right? So you almost have two hours that a patron could come in and serve himself. Come on. You're telling me, first off, when the vendor guy gets there, there's nobody there, okay? So I thought, well, there's a potential that at 11 o'clock, the cook is there, you know, and somebody would come in and eat. Kitchen lights on, there's nobody there. There's no other car in the parking lot except for Brenda's. There's nobody there. So you're telling me a single individual is going to come in there between 11 and 12.50 a.m., look around, the lights are off. Look around and say, uh, what the hell? Walk behind the bar, reach into the cooler, and pull out a bottle of beer. Drink it, and then lay $2 there. Come on. Yes, it's possible, but it's not probable. It's possible Bigfoot's running around in my backyard right now. Right now. But it's not probable, folks. That beer bottle is the offender's. And that beer bottle has the offender's DNA on it. It's long gone now. <sighs> That's what I think happened. And I think evidence, proclivity, experience backs everything up that I'm saying. Now, I want to throw in something that I, I talked to somebody and I don't know whether it's related or not, but I'm going to bring it up because there is a possibility of it being related. On the night Brenda disappeared, remember, she clocked out. It's so good that she cashed out and it time stamped at 1.30. Because that gives us a timeline. At 2 o'clock in the morning, a person in Milesburg, near the American Legion in that park area, heard a woman scream. Now, 
I bring this up because it fits in the timeline. Where was Ron staying? Milesburg. Okay. Now, it's a little bit far apart from it's a couple miles from the hotel. But it is a direct route from Zion Road. And if he abducts her, listen, he didn't kill her, I don't believe, in the bar. Okay? It's possible. But I think, I think anger and remember I said in the beginning, I always believed that this was a sex crime and I still do. So if that's the case, he's got to take her somewhere secluded to perform the sexual assault. He's not from the area, but he's been here a couple weeks. Is that an area that he would go? To do that, 2 o'clock in the morning, that is, that fits the time frame. And that could have been Brenda's scream. I'm not sold on that, okay? You know, that is a little bit of a leap, but I do know it's in route to where they were working in Snowshoe. That I know. But I don't need that. I don't need that scream. Uh, for my my theory to work. I just know beyond a shadow of a doubt that single beer bottle is the key. Somebody was waiting for Brenda to get off work. Now, you'll say, well, it still could be Greg. Greg was with his brother. Greg was with his brother's girlfriend. He was home. He had nothing to do with this. Okay? Sometimes it's the simplicity of things. You have to block out the noise and say, oh, it's a drug hit. I never believed that. I entertained it. I looked at that angle. But I don't believe that. Okay? And I won't believe that. If it's a drug hit and you send a message, first of all, how many drug hits have there been in Belfont, Center County? It's, it's far-fetched. If you want to send a message, you shoot Brenda in the head and you leave her there. Put a note on her forehead. This is for Greg. That doesn't happen. So instead, you're going to abduct her and then be ambiguous and place her boots in the men's bathroom? No, that doesn't make sense. A single offender who had the proclivity, who was seen in the bar, we know that by the sketch, who was in the bar previous to that, and then lied to me about it. There's only one reason to lie about it. Listen, you're, I know he's watching this. He's told me. So let me speak to you for a second, Ron. The only reason you lie or minimize your actions is because you're hiding something. That's the only reason. You're not 77 years old like Carl, and can't remember stuff? No. The gig's up, buddy. I did my job. Okay? This is what I see happen. And again, remember, the lights play a big role in this as well. The lights were off when the vendor got there again except for the girls bathroom in the kitchen that means all the lights were on all of them were on she deposited that money in the manager's office put on her coat put on her purse walking out to grab her boots boots are gone because he hit them in the bathroom turned out the lights in the bathroom which leaves 
the bar lights on, the girls' bathroom lights on, and the kitchen lights on. The conflict took place, whatever it was. The offender turns out the lights during the course of whatever he's doing or before he leaves. He turns out the lights. Why? Because he doesn't want to be seen. He's just done something. Okay? It's almost like it's natural instinct. But he doesn't go and turn off the girl's bathroom lights. He doesn't turn off the kitchen light. Brenda was going to do that on her way out the door. He stopped that. He interfered with that. And that's why when the vendor guy gets there, he says, or the rug guy gets there, bathroom, men's bathroom was off, girls' bathroom was on, kitchen was on. The big bar lights are off. Now, when I talk to the vendor guy, he says exactly that. The lights were off in the main bar area. He turned them on for a second so he could finish working, doing what he was doing at the pool table. And when he left, he turned them back off. Why? Because nobody was there. There was no patrons there drinking. That's how I know that the single beer bottle belonged to the offender. And that offender is Ron. I'm going to look at my notes and see if I missed anything that I want to share with you. Um, and then that's it, folks. So these are facts about Ron. He was staying at the Econo Lodge in Milesburg. The bartender there, remember who he slept with, and she says tried to choke her. He was blunt, asked her to go back to his room, would sit at the end of the bar at last call. I talked to somebody that said that Ron carried a gun in his truck. Could that have something to do with this abduction? Sure, it could. There, I believe maybe there had to be some sort of obvious show of force to Brenda. He was at Carlsbad's Tavern on Monday, 2.25. He hit on Brenda, and she shut him off. The next day, February 26th, a sketch of an unidentified man made from the patrons who saw the man there. The sketch was ID'd by the Milesburg bartender and, not just her, Ron's work crew. All identified that sketch as Ron. He then lies to me and says he was there only there one time. Well, it's false. He was there twice that I can put him there. But I believe he was there at least a couple other times previous to that. Here's another thing. He lied to me because he says he only went to Carlsbad's Tavern to shoot pool because the Econo Lodge didn't have a pool table. Well, that's a lie. That's an absolute lie. Because, and again, this is minimizing. You don't want to say the real reason that you went there. It's to get that girl. The one that flirted with you. For two nights. So you're going to say, hey, my intentions to go there is to shoot pool. And I say to him, well, why didn't you shoot pool at the Milesburg Econo Lodge? Didn't they have a pool table? No, they didn't have a pool table. That's a lie. The Milesburg bartender shot pool with him. And then, again, on March 9th at Duffy's Tavern, he's talking constantly about the Brenda Condon case. Enough so that this bartender, who is a female, of course, is it predatory behavior? Could be. But she calls police and says, hey, you need to check this guy out. She's not the only one. His work crew, every individual that I talk to, one thing I can tell you, Ken, is that he was kind of obsessed with that case.
I uh, gave you my opinion, but I have it written here in note form. And so I'll just go over it one more time. He was in the bar on February 26th, hitting on Brenda. She turns him down partly because she had sex earlier that day. That's his beer bottle and tip money on the bar. I have here he abducts her at gunpoint. That may not be true. Um, it could certainly just been by force. Again, because of that rug being overturned, it almost feels like she was drug out of the bar, but I can't say for certain, so I won't. The Milesburg scream heard at 2 o'clock. And lastly, um, he takes her to where they were working, and he buried her there. Now, why do I say that? The information that I received from members of that work crew is that the heavy equipment machinery was moved up there. Now, they can't pinpoint a time. That would be nice, right? If they said, hey, on February 27th, we went up there and the machinery was moved. But remember, they don't know that they, there's even a girl missing. But as weeks, months, years go by, and they think about it, and now they know that there's a missing girl, they think back and say, oh, remember that night? Or the day that we went up there that morning and the equipment was moved and the track was slipped off of the excavator? They told me, hey, we kind of joked about it, you know, that Ron could have been involved. It's no joke. Okay? I even specifically asked this crew member, could it have been kids up there messing around with that heavy equipment? Yeah, there's a fence around it. Uh, I don't think so. If you're running that excavator at night, it's a good possibility because of visibility. And maybe because you're not the person who's supposed to run that excavator. That the track gets slipped. I'm just, I'm telling you facts. Talked about the boots. Took them off for an unknown reason. Whether it's because of snow, her feet hurt because she was cleaning, whatever it was. She removed those boots. She placed them on the bar. That's opinion. I have no facts backing that up. She put on her coat, her purse, from the office when she took the money in there. The offender took the boots and put them in the Mad's bathroom and turned out the lights. She comes out, can't find their boots. It's him and her. They're the only people in there. She's now angry because he has bothered her for two nights in a row. And now she's taken, he's taken her boots and playing this little cat and mouse game. She's not in the mood for a cat and mouse game. She wants to go home. She has no interest in you. But you have an interest in her. And you're not going to let it go. He leaves the kitchen light on because he had turned out the main light. I already went over that. I'm not going to go over it a hundred times. In my opinion, folks, all that makes sense. The totality of all the pieces of evidence put together, the proclivity, the evidence, the eyewitness statements, uh, the things that he did, him lying to me. Him being there, I can put him there. On the night she disappeared and the night previous. So what's next? Well, as I told you, for the most part, my work here is done. I did what I said I would do. Now, I will give all this information to Brenda's family. They have it. I feel it's their place to do whatever they want with it. Go to the media. Go to the police. Give them a chance to make this right. Hindsight's always 2020. 
right? I remember working on a case in the district attorney's office, a cold case. And I went down, I sat down with the district attorney and I said, the police missed this, 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 this is what happened. And he said, how would you like somebody to second guess your work? That always stuck with me. And I, I wouldn't. Yet, it's the truth of the matter, okay? I think that they messed, they messed this up. And that's hard for me to say. Listen, I'm not a strict thin blue line type of guy. Yes, I was a cop. 16 years, I get that. But for me, it's never, hey, the cops are always correct. I'm not that type of guy. There's people like that. And so what? That's the way you are. The way I am is truth. And if the cops screw something up, I'm going to say it. Now, they made mistakes. Hey, I've made mistakes in investigations, without a doubt. But hey, we're here to overcome that. Let's work together. For justice for Brenda, okay? You have to put your ego aside. And listen, in this case, there was a lot of egos. There was people that did not want to talk to me. The relieving bartender was a prick to me. I ain't answering anything you say. I've already given my statement enough time, blah, 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 blah. Listen, he has the opinion, or he, he can do and say, what he wants. He's tired of talking about it. That's fine. You don't want to help me out. You're not the first person in life that don't want to help me out. I'll do it on my own. Okay. But there was some, the troopers that worked on the case. They were very polite and helpful to me in figuring this out. And sometimes you just need a non-biased eye. To step back. And I think Spring Township Police, I think they were biased in the beginning. They looked at Brenda as a party girl that would come back. And it, it was the wrong assumption. You have to treat every case important. Hey, the, treat it as foul play. Because then if it is, hey, you, your bases are covered. But if it isn't and you just treat it like She'll come back. Well, this is what happens. A case goes cold for 33 years. And a family doesn't have the answers. So I'm able to look at these cases with a non-biased eye. And say, hey, this is what happened. This was, this was not the toughest case I've ever worked. Okay? It has its pits and valleys. But once I got all the evidence together... I think it's it's rather simple. Through the years, rumors and people's opinions is what makes a case difficult. Because you have to sort through them. We have to sort through Greg, the drug dealer. We have to sort through Craig or Carl being crazy and saying crazy things. Okay? The obituary on Greg's mom's page or whatever it was when Carl says, that's just Carl. But he didn't do this. But he's lived under a, 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 a cloud of suspicion. Even with me. Hey, I had to start. He was saying some weird stuff. Not him. Greg Palazzari, the big drug kingpin of State College. Okay, had to been him. He was the boyfriend. He owed drug dealers money. He buried her at Greg Sunoco. All this is bullshit. And he had to live with that cloud of suspicion as well. That's one of the frustrating cases about, or like, I, I don't like that. The people get lumped up in it. Like, the, for example, let's just say a friend of mine, female friend, 
gets murdered. And I had sent her a message, you know, hey, happy Easter. 33 years from now, people will look at that stuff and they'll be like, well, Ken Maines, he, he knew how to get away with murder. He's a cold case detective. And he sent her a message the day of. He, it had to be him. So then I get lumped into this. And all of a sudden, everybody's looking at me cross-eyed because they think that I had something to do with the murder that I had absolutely nothing to do with. That's how I feel about Greg. That's how I feel about Carl. And anybody else that got lumped up into this that people pointed the finger at. They pointed the finger at the wrong person. Okay? Now, there's still going to be some people out there who say, Kenny Maines, you're an idiot. You're wrong. I'm not here to change your opinions. I'm here to give you mine based on training, experience, and doing what I do for the past 20 years. It's my opinion that because of that single beer bottle, that's the offender. And he was there at last call with Brenda trying to get her. And unfortunately, he did get her. So, that's just my opinion. I'll take this information, give it to the family, and they can do what they want to do with it. I'll always be there for them. For whatever guidance, whatever support I can lend to them, I will do that. It's my hope that the offender comes forward and says, you know what? It's time. It's time to give Brenda's family the closure, the resolution, the peace that they so deserve. That's my hope. That'll be my prayer tonight that the offender does this. Mistakes happen. Accidents happen. Ron's hairpin trigger, which every one of the crew members told me, not one, not two, all of them, get beat red in his face, angered very quickly. It all came together, folks. It all came together. I want to thank the police officers who helped me, gave me information, vital information on this case. I'd like to thank the numerous people that came forward. Alicia, Betty the bartender, the guy that owned Hillside, Lori Hoffman, um, Tangi. I mean, there's just so many people that came forward and gave me little bits of information here and there that I put together. Some I could throw away, some I gathered. The community, they never forgot Brenda. And Brenda's family, they you guys have got to be so, and I know you are, so grateful for the community. Not for me, this is what I do, okay? I, I'm thankful to help you. But the community, they didn't forget about Brenda. And they gave this info. Did they give it 33 years ago? Maybe, maybe not. But it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And I think we finished well here. The chapter's not over, okay? There's still some more to do. But for me, for Mystery at Carl's Bad Tavern, the mystery's over for me, okay? To me, I solved this case for me and I think for the family. Yes, we want Brenda's remains and that'll be the next step. But 
for the the totality of everything, I believe this case is solved. I believe the family probably thinks that as well. And I know I think that. So, that's it. Might be an update here and there for this case that I can show. But for the most part, we're done here. It's been a... Uh, been an emotional ride thank you for coming along and I'm glad I could present this case to you and show you what an investigator does and being as transparent as possible and yes I know who Ron is I know his last name I know where he lives Family will get that information. The police will get that information. Listen, evidence has to be pretty convincing for me to pinpoint a suspect. Normally, I don't do that. Normally, it's like this is the type of offender that committed it. The evidence here is pretty strong to me that I can pinpoint the offender. It's my opinion. sad it's sad that this that family those kids had to grow up without her mom because of the actions in, of one individual this is a case that has kind of it's always been on my mind since 1991 when I was in 11th grade and I always wished that I could work on this case it's almost like when I was playing Little League and I wanted to play for the Pirates. It's, it's very emotional. Because now I believe that it, for the most part, is over. And I did investigate this case. Something that I always wanted to do. And I hope that I helped. And I hope I helped the community. And I hope that I helped Brenda's family, first and foremost. So, with that said, thanks for watching Mystery at Carlsbad's Tavern. I'm Ken Maines, Cold Case Investigator. Thanks for watching this final episode. Maines out. Hey, yo, lesson here, babe. You come at the king, you best not miss. <laughs>